African-American in men, we often depicted, yet rarely described, sometimes admired, but seldom celebrated. AT&T, a company dedicated to better communication among all people, continues its long-standing commitment to education, enlightenment, and equality with a portrait of African-American men speaking our minds straight from our hearts. Yo, fellas, y'all ready to do this? Yo, what's up, y'all? Well, in a sense, I think we are an endangered species, and the fact that we're losing our identity, and black males aren't dependent on one another as much as we used to. So, but genetically, no, we're not an endangered species. We'll always be a strong trait in the community. I don't feel I'm an endangered species, um, but in, in a sense, I feel I'm in danger. Trouble is important to me because I don't want to die over something like drugs. That's that's one. That's a dead end anyway. So I'd rather struggle the right way than the wrong way. My father, he got off the he got off the wrong track of the world. Well he had, he left my mama. But she still she still raised us right, you know, but all she can. And my mom, my grandmother helped out. And I turned out all right. I'm still in school. They're all sorts of the home. Whatever happens in the home has a big effect on their mind, you know, on what they like to do or what type of things that get them in trouble as far as, you know, making fast money or whatever. There is something out there if you go out and reach for an education and become something in life for yourself. It's all what you do for yourself. My mother never taught me to be uh, a thief or to hurt anybody. And uh, I just wasn't raised like that. They didn't, my mother never taught me anything like that. One of the reasons probably why I don't you know, go the wrong way because well, basically it's probably installed in me by my parents. You know, like my mother and my father, they talk to me a lot, you know. And plus, as I, I can, you know, look at things and, you know, have my own point of view about certain things instead of, you know, just believing what this person says, you know, I look at it for myself. Hello, I'm Louis Gossett, Jr. Welcome to the first hour of Images and Realities, African American Men. In recent months, America has been bombarded with disturbing images of black men. Statistics have been paraded before us. One out of four will not finish high school. There are more black men in prison than in college. The leading cause of death among young black men is homicide. Our young men have been called a lost generation and even an endangered species, as if they were set apart by biology, a different species from the rest of humanity. How balanced are these images? How accurate are these statements? To find out, we'll visit cities throughout the country, from Detroit to Houston, from Washington to Denver, and New York to Los Angeles. We'll speak with many remarkable families, organizations, and individuals. We'll talk with everyday people about the problems they face and the answers they have come up with. Mothers like Yvette Glover of Newark, raising three sons alone. Fathers like Clarence James in Atlanta, who thinks a good report card is a work of art. Teachers like Corla Hawkins in Chicago, who put her money where her heart is. And we will speak with social experts from our Washington, D.C. roundtable. And from Virginia, Governor Douglas Wilder's 21st Century Commission on African American Men. We will also have conversations with many prominent public officials, such as Maynard Jackson, mayor of Atlanta, and David Dinkins, mayor of New York. And many black celebrities who will offer their experiences, not as stars, but as concerned men of color. Images and realities will follow the course of young black men's lives through many faces, many stories. 
And that journey for everyone begins with family. But family for African Americans means many things. My grandmother uh, raised me, and uh, I suppose we were what you'd call uh, hardcore poor. But I remember that uh, she always was able somehow through her own industry and I suppose vision, uh, able to uh, give, us, give us a sense of worth and dignity. Well, I've had my grandson two years. For Annie Manning, even at the age of 67, it means taking her two grandsons out of an abusive household and raising yet another generation. They're my granddaughters, too. They was abused, and I just went to court. They just swatted me. Them, they swatted me. me. And so she gets her last straight night. When you're a child, you're just a child. You're just growing up. And I don't really know if you're ever really aware of being poor or being rich or being disadvantaged. You just live the way you live. For Mr. and Mrs. Oliver, it means using community support to help their sons get through a difficult separation. I don't think that it's hard for black couples to stay together. I don't think it's hard for couples, period, to stay together, but there has to be a mutual understanding. We both share, we both share them, you know. They, they have, still have both our love. When they separate, I feel sad about it. But uh, I just hope, stayed in there and, and kept praying, asking the Lord to make them, make them leave, come back together. One could argue that I was a product of a broken home. On the other hand, I had an awful lot of love and affection. But it is important to have uh, uh, a parent or some adult that cares about young people. I'm in a gifted program. My favorite subject is math because when I'm doing math, I feel like I'm on top. And it's easy for us being in a gifted program with the students and the teachers. They stress and they make you do your work. Victor Mosley's parents grapple with economic hardships but still manage to keep their family bonds strong. There's a lot of black people aren't able to send their kids to school in which I'm not either. You know. So I try to teach him, you know, keep his grades up because he's a very smart young man and he keeps his grades up, he get, will get an academic scholarship I have. No doubt. You better come off or you get left. This is my brother Craig. He might be a little taller than me, but you know, he still look up to me. Everything we did, we did as a family. When we went to school, it was as a family. You hold this one's hand, that one holds that one hand, that one holds that one hand. After school, you wait on your brothers and sisters and everybody comes home together. When you play, you know where you're. And my mother screamed out the window, where's Damon? You can bet I knew where he was. Reverend Clarence James represents the generations of black fathers whose love, creativity, and determination have always been a key part of the black experience. I'm Reverend Clarence James, uh, a native of the west side of Chicago, Illinois, born and bred on the west side, the son of Jesse James, Jr. of Eudor, Arkansas, and Mamie Louise, graves of Monroe, Louisiana. I'm the husband of Miriam, the former Miriam Johnson of Atlanta, Georgia, and the father of six children, four boys and two girls. Me and my father went round and round, but I know this man loved me, and, I, and this man never missed a basketball game I played in. I mean, we're six kids in my family. He went, him and my mother went to almost every event we ever did. We will meet two university students who will give us some insights from their generation's perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm rocking, you know, the same style that I, I, I grew up with. You know, they automatically seem, assume that I'm going to mug them or something. But most of all, we will introduce you to many young African-American men from all walks of life. They will share their insights, opinions, and their thoughts. How do they see the world and their place in it? Throughout the program, we will examine current images of African-American men and stand them up against the realities that we have found. The comparisons will surprise you. The reality of black men is that if someone does something in California, if a black man does that in California, if a black man robs somebody in Maine, if someone gets shot in Atlanta by a black man, I did it. And that's the reality of black men.
America often simplifies the complexities of the African-American condition. A common image today suggests that the stresses confronting young black men are largely due to single parent homes. Just what are these realities of single black parents? We visited several to find out. We did not really have a big family. It was basically my mother and I. And because she was still a very young woman when she had me, she decided early on that her son was going to be her buddy. Her son was going to be her friend. And uh, obviously uh, the reverse hold true, held true because she has always been my best friend. We've always been there for each other. When I found myself being a single parent, I think I just tried not to think about it too much. I, you know, I'm just one of those kinds of people that uh, I, I don't shirk responsibility. I don't seek it either. But then there comes a time where people start saying, well, you know, he needs some male images in it. You know? And then you go home and you agonize over that. Candy Brown and John Wesley are two single parents who are combining their families and rededicating themselves to their community. I can't think of anything more difficult than trying to be a single parent. Why do I say that? Because, first of all, just as you point out, I raised two girls. Although I must add, I come from a very large family and they have aunties and cousins and... Uh, female friends and so they've had you know they've had that influence but they had to report to the old man as a young male uh, the images that I saw in my life the male images that I saw in my life my grandfather my uncle uh, my mother's boyfriend Pete who was the biggest influence in my life uh, was someone who was bigger than life who got up and went to work every day and loved to work hard. Raising her three sons alone, Yvette Glover gives a unique face to the black single mother. I think, you know what I'm saying, what makes us stick together more besides God is my mother. I would just always be with my children. And so many people in Newark can attest to that today. That's how they refer to me as that lady who always took her children everywhere she, you know, even to school. When I went to college, they, were, they went to school with me. Uh, I was the president of the uh, student government Essex County College in Newark uh, for two and a half years. And my children spent many evenings up in my office with me. So what I did, I kept my children with me. Are we gonna talk about me or my son? I'm sorry. Uh, well, we'll be happy to see Trey back in class on Tuesday. Um, his suspension was only for three days, you know. No, I don't think you'll be seeing Trey again. And why is that, may I ask? Because Trey is going to live with his father. His father? Yes, his father. Or did you think we made babies by ourselves? In Los Angeles, Richard Owens, a divorced father, tries to work through the year of estrangement with his son, Renard. But when he was a, a baby, we were very close. And being an absent father, it's, it's not the same. Uh, and as you can see, there's a bit of a standoffish attitude and I have to pull things from him and it's hard it's very difficult when you want to know and you just can't get it out of him when I'm around with all my friends and stuff and something happens you can't go tell your father what happened you have to go deal with your mother and stuff like that and most of um, the people I hang around with they don't go around their mother and stuff that's why we'd rather go to somebody that we know like a like a man or something because I wouldn't want to tell my mother what happened I'd hear one thing from peer pressure and another from my mother and father, so I always was able to sit and ask myself, okay, which one of these voices do you want to hear right now? My father worked hard all his life, but he didn't have... And through here, I might be able to get something. It's just anything. I'm just, I'm trying. I only see him every now and then, and I hate to be a preacher every time I see him. So I have to let him go through these things and put a little in at a time without being a, an overbearing. Every time you see me, I'm always on his case because I know something's wrong. I don't want that, but that's what it's like when you're a father away from your kids. I hate when a brother makes a child and then denies it, thinking that money is the answer, so he buys it. A whole bunch of gifts and a lot of presents. It's not the presence, it's your presence and the essence of being there. One of the most damaging images of young black men is that they irresponsibly father children, then abandon them. In fact, many are still children themselves. Proper guidance, understanding, and support is essential here. And as a result, 
the reality can be quite different. The National Institute of Responsible Fatherhood and Family Development in Cleveland seeks to make teen fathers viable, healthy, and responsible members of the community by reestablishing the primacy of the family. Home of marriage is, is just, uh, is really a prayer in action because uh, when I was 17 years old, I met my wife and I met her at Cleveland Heights High School by accident. And uh, we got married this November and, and the rest is like, like history. My wife is a tremendous form of rep um, support for me. We've discovered in the last nine years when young fathers come into this program, they're looking for someone to give them that support, to say to them, this is the way you got to do it. Being a teenage father, it's, it's, it's not really that hard. The, the only hard thing about it is, um, is the money, the money problems, the medical bills and stuff like that, because you got to go have a checkup and stuff like that. Because I, I have an understanding family. They, they helping me out, because right now they know I'm in school. And most places that I go to, they be like, um, can't find a job during school hours. I have to be out of school in order to work. In most places. In other places, stuff ain't available. So my family, they, they helping me out until I get out of school. I got to get them up in the morning to school. So that's a rough six o'clock. They go to school two and a half minutes away from here. They get up at six. They ain't got to be to school until 8.30 and sometimes they wait. <laughs> that's a job. It's like I'm a single parent, but I have help. Myself, my brother, my sister being around, I think all of that makes a difference because they're able to see that family unit and that bond, which was something that I saw. I want to um, watch my son grow up because my, my father wasn't there for me. And I always felt like guilty because I really don't know my father the way I want to. I don't want my son to just know my name. I want him to know my habits, my eating habits, sleeping habits, all that other stuff. I want him to know me. Education for black Americans has been an avenue of advancement since Reconstruction. When freed, we were legally allowed to pursue learning for the first time. We went from a 90% illiteracy rate to a 50% literacy rate in a decade. Today, we are confronting a crisis in education. The image is that our public schools are collapsing, black parents are disinterested, and education is no longer valued or valid. The mother works, and she goes to work at our bit work at 530. So I called her at 4, and then I stayed up every morning. And then I go get children clothes and I get them ready to go to school because they leave at 15 out of 7. My grandmother uh, always expected something of me and us, my brother and two sisters. And uh, I, I, I think that may have uh, uh, put a trajectory on us and uh, a guiding principle, uh, and, uh, making it possible to dream further than some of my friends may have. Come on, Jacket. Have a good day. Have a good you can day, ask about the switch. The Reeds live in a comfortable suburb of St. Louis Hi. County. Their three sons are the second generation of this experiment called integration. I want you to, Jeff, when you come home from school today, make sure you do your homework right away, all right? And don't waste a lot of time watching television. Okay? Jeffrey is still uh, finding himself. Uh, right now, he thinks that he has to do everything that we say. Uh, he is worried that he's going to have to go to his dad's alma mater. <laughs> and the other boys are, are trying to get him to see that he can make his own decisions. The educational day of a child begins when they wake up mm -hmm. and ends mm -hmm. when they go to sleep. 9% of a child's time is actually spent in the classroom. Therefore, 91% of his education takes place out of the classroom. Where does it take place? 
It takes place back into the family. It takes place in the community. It takes place in wherever this child moves. My mother, she made me. She, I mean, it was really her that got me through school. I, uh, I became disinterested after sixth grade. My grades were always pretty good. And then I got to about fifth or sixth, sixth, seventh grade. I just started getting bored with the whole thing. I wanted to do other things. I didn't know what, you know, but I knew that that the basic algebra and the stuff they were teaching me in grade school and that I had to, so-called, had to learn, wasn't going to help me. So she, uh, she stayed on me. Dr. Hugh Derby of Philadelphia not only struggles with single parenthood, but the educational disruption that separation causes children. Well, I, I think it's absolutely vital for, for, uh, uh, for all people to be involved with their kids if, if they want their kids to grow up in, in a favorable, uh, favorable way. I think especially for African Americans, because of all the uh, potential for not developing well, um, I, uh, I make it a point and I work hard at uh, being available for my kids and doing things with them, stressing education, making sure I a great school that's going to give her a better life than she did. That's a hero, and that's a role model. And the way that I was educated uh, just 20 years ago in high school is not the way uh, children are going to be educated in high schools today. Uh, their uh, reference is much broader. Uh, their understandings are much keener. Uh, their thirst for knowledge is much greater. And their ability to see through things uh, that, quite frankly, uh, are not stimulating uh, is much heightened. Uh, so we must find different ways to educate our children. And we must do one other thing. We must get back to a point in time where the teacher is an honored person in the community. Now, genes are found on something else, and we call those chroma what? No. Now, in dealing with chromosomes, we get 23 from the what? Mother and 23 from the what? Father. Show you're right. You're looking good. You never think that a person will want to learn about plants or, you know, animals and things. When you talk to him and he talks to you, you'd be like, wow, I didn't know this really happens on the inside of a plant. Or how does a plant reproduce or, you know, feeds on other things? And I was like, wow, you know, this, I didn't know this could happen. And, you know, he makes it seem exciting that way. Guys, to be smart is not the most masculine thing to be. So I know it, but I don't want to say it. And it is my job to, to disarm that part of you. And I want you to come out and be just as smart as you want to be. I really enjoy you, because I can relate with the sciences, because I got A out this class, so I guess I can. My father was going to be an architect. He had got drafted for Vietnam. So um, I think I should just pursue his career, his dream. But it'd be my dream, too. The creativity of the students, I found, is the same. But I find the motivation uh, more difficult. I, they, the students in the past, uh, 20 years ago, you could give an assignment and it would bring it in. Now it's like pulling teeth, getting things to be done. The talent is there, the motivation, the perseverance, the desire to succeed is less. Like you have to instill that. I think it's more the teacher's job. John has one deficiency that we, we have recognized that we're working on is trying to develop in him the fire and the love and the passion for learning. As I grow older, I want to get a good education and try to succeed and go into college. My father felt, I, I don't care how old he is, you know, uh, soon enough he's going to grow. He needs to grow with the knowledge beforehand. You know, he can never be too young to know about certain things. In my old school, when you would try hard, they would make fun of you. So my parents got me out of that environment and brought me to this school, to a better environment where everybody's trying and nobody can bring you down. Being a minority in a predominantly white campus is hard at times, but you just have to stay what you have to stay and just show them that you are as equal as them intellectually. Amen. as being a child growing up in a military family. I have nothing now looking back on it but positive things to say about it because the best thing that happened was we were in and out of different environments and different communities all the time. So you learn how to relate to all kinds of different people. Yeah, yeah. 
This is my second son, Sean, and he's an honor student. He's been to Senegal and West Africa this year and has scholarship offers from over 100 different colleges and universities. We heard the statistics that one out of four young black males between the ages of 20 and 29 are involved in the criminal justice system, uh, either in jail, prison, or parole. That figure may be true, or it may be somewhat inflated, but the point is the press plays up that one out of four and rarely talks about the three out of four who are not involved. And those are the ones who are doing positive things. Those are the ones who are going to college, in the Army, and making contributions to society. Another statistic is that 50% of black kids are dropping out of school. Well, that's just not true. But if you look at the national picture, young blacks are finishing high school in higher rates than they have ever done. 76% of young blacks do finish high school. We need to look at the more positive statistics rather than always uh, choosing the negative statistics. Knowing from the time that you are born that someone wants you to fail is a very difficult thing for you to deal with. That is not, you know, uh, that is not the kind of environment that breeds success. One of the more damaging statistics reported in recent months is that there are more black men between the ages of 18 and 25 who are in jail than in college. An actual headcount? Maybe. However, more black men attend college today than just five years ago. And black colleges themselves are experiencing a resurgence both in financial support and attendance. I'm a speech pathology and audiology major here at Howard, and um, basically my aspirations are to be just at the forefront of the music industry in any way possible, and um, at the same time, try to pursue my career as an audiologist. An aspiration like in the music industry, this is a one in a million chance. I mean, persistence eventually pays off, but especially as a black person, you have to have a solid base, you know what I'm saying? You have to have the knowledge and you, know, you have to basically have that certificate that says, I know this. We out here trying to make it. We trying to get ours in this world and it doesn't mean hurting the next man. It starts with people like us believing and knowing who we are. Young African Americans have always displayed personal styles full of humor, color, and attitude. But don't be fooled by it. The choice is yours. Too often a child, the only males that he sees are people that are into all kinds of um, negative behavior, uh, the dope dealers or um, hustlers, gamblers, pimps and all that. And uh, my God, if we could just bring them and show them a place like Morehouse. After graduation, I plan to spend a semester at Morehouse School of Medicine working in a research laboratory while applying and interviewing for medical school. I like to end up in psychiatry, that's the field, counseling young adolescents. <laughs> worthwhile field to get into. Looking forward to it. Psychologists uh, have an environment that is conducive for many students to strengthen their self-esteem in addition to receiving a high quality educational experience in the classroom and become more confident of their ability to achieve any goal that they might set for themselves. It is the commitment and the dedication that one has, regardless of position, title, etc., that you commit to these young people. If you have a support system and a connection so that when those young people come into that classroom, they know that you're not just a figurehead, but you're a place to, a place to be, that word gets out and there's a system. Given the opportunity and combined with solid financial support, our African-American youngsters fully utilize their opportunities for college attendance and higher education. It's important to me to be an officer in the Army, so I came down to take advantage of the two-year commissioning program that they have here because of the school's reputation and because of the scholarship that I was offered. If I could just teach all of the friends that I grew up with to always strive for excellence. Some of them strive for the mediocrity. They go halfway. Here's Grand Hill. Let's see if he can finish this one. He will. 
instilled values into me. And uh, really, I had to abide by them. I had to do well in school, and uh, I wasn't allowed to do things that my friends were, were doing. So because of that, I, I formed these good values, formed these good habits, and uh, then they stuck with me throughout my, my career, back in high school and in college. I worked so hard for my parents, and I think that's what it basically occurred from. I wanted to do well most of my life, and I never saw myself short. I have aspirations uh, of becoming a lawyer and maybe a senator. There are students on this campus who might look at you and think that the only reason you're here is because you're black, and you got a good jump shot. Or you're black, so you can run with a football. Or you're just here because you're black. That isn't fair. And it might not be fair that you've got to prove that you're here because you've earned it, but you do. The greatest nightmare in the minds of many white Americans is an educated black man. And I want to produce all kinds of nightmares in this country. There was a time when people felt that education was something that was only for the few. And that if we didn't really push it, who mattered? And what mattered? Now we see how heavily it impacts our workforce and the competitiveness as it relates to jobs going overseas, going out of our states into other countries. And our people come to America better trained, better skilled, and take those jobs, not because they're better people, but because they're better trained. Unemployment is a major national problem and certainly not limited to the black experience. But the fact is, that African-American men remain the most affected. And today, even with more education, our economic future remains uncertain. When we lived in segregated societies, we were the merchants in those segregated communities. And as integration occurred, and as businesses began to get larger and provide these services, many of the small black entrepreneurs disappear. We're trying to reestablish that. This is not the most devastating of times in our experience in this nation. That in many ways we have the largest group of educated, affluent African American people that we've ever had. Things have been much worse for black men in this nation than they are right now. The challenges that we have are very different. And I think coming out of the 60s and early 70s, we had some grand expectations. We weren't ready for crack to run roughshod through our communities. We believe that many more African-American men and women would have been able to build businesses. We didn't expect the education system to falter, to fail. So I think we've been caught unawares in many ways. What's the problem? Can get your chair? There are a lot of us out here, and it's black and white. And um, it's just unfortunate that the unemployment rate is just so high in Michigan. You know, I'm even thinking about relocating because it's just, it seems like it's not getting better. You're not educated, and the company, uh, you get laid off, and your unemployment is exhausted. Where are you going to go after that? Education is the key for our young people in order for them to succeed in the, in the construction industry or whatever field that they uh, endeavor. We well, definitely need more jobs, but uh, with the crime rate being what it is, there's not too many people that are willing to bring any kind of work into this, this uh, location. If we want to foster uh, economic growth and economic development in our communities, one of the first things we would concentrate on is the elimination of crime. It always amazes me when I see newspapers and television shows where they portray criminals as black, drug addicts as black, all welfare people as black. And the truth is that the majority of poor people in this country are white. The majority of welfare dependent people in this country are white. And yet the faces of poverty, the faces of crime, the faces of drug addiction are always shown as either black or other minority groups. It is nonsense for our government not to understand that joblessness contributes to the federal deficit uh, about which they're so concerned. One percent of unemployment, a 1% rise in unemployment translates into $45 billion in the deficit. So we need to find ways to put people back to work. And the people who are out of work in greatest numbers are folks that look like me and you. There are African American males who continue to work every day and take care of their children and run cities and do marvelous things, run businesses. Those are the men we don't see 
on the nightly news. African Americans are the first to admit that we face serious threats in this decade, challenges to our communities and to the health of our children. One of those threats may be the way we are portrayed and how that portrayal affects the way we see ourselves. By the year 2010, uh, minorities and women will dominate the workforce by, to the tune of 83%. That's the only team you got to suit up <laughs> if you're going to play. In part two of Images and Realities, we will continue conversations with our families. The Manning, the Mosleys of St. Louis, the Jameses, Yvette Glover in New York. And you will meet some new faces, black men who speak for themselves and from their own experiences. A decorated Vietnam veteran who is traveling the long way back from drug abuse. A poet and playwright whose personal encounter with violence altered his life's path forever. A father who turned a private tragedy into a commitment to save others. We will look at the impact of imagery on our values and actions. How our young men are perceiving our young women and themselves. Images. We seem to live by them. But how much do these images reflect reality? The next hour of images and realities, African-American men will bring them all into focus. The issues being examined in this program are crucial to our society. With its support, AT&T continues an association with our community that began when Louis Latimer, an African-American, drafted the plans for Alexander Graham Bell's first telephone. I'm Lewis Gossett, Jr. The first thing that a man has to be able to do as he moves from boyhood to manhood, he's got to be able to take care of himself. He's got to become an, an independent entity economically, financially, not to mention mentally, uh, emotionally, uh, in terms of decision making. But a boy that has no skills can't find a job. Not only can't find a job, there are no jobs. It's another thing we don't understand is that unemployment is built into the American economic system. Unemployment is not an anomaly. It's not something strange. It's not a, a downturn in the economic cycle. It's built into the system. You cannot have successful capitalism without having unemployment. African-American men, we often depicted, yet rarely described, sometimes admired, but seldom celebrated. AT&T, a company dedicated to better communication among all people, continues its long-standing commitment to education, enlightenment, and equality with a portrait of African-American men, speaking our minds straight from our hearts. I'm Louis Gossett, Jr. Welcome to part two of Images and Realities, African-American Men. In our last hour, we spoke to African-Americans across the country who are struggling through these perplexing times and who are determined to persevere with their families, with their children, and their education, with their employment, with their lives. We also found that much of what we see and hear about black men is misleading. Over the last few years, images have become so pervasive that resentment, distrust, fear and rejection, even self-hatred, have found their way into the daily lives of many young African-American men. So, we talked to black men who are confronting these most serious challenges. Jesse Smith in Chicago, fighting back 
from drug abuse? Lynn Manning in Los Angeles, his eyesight taken away, but not his insight. Percy LaCour, surviving the realities of street life. And Les Franklin, a hero for the ages. We will look at what part imagery plays. Is the imagery we see every day contributing to problems of survival in the street? Is the imagery becoming reality? Can we find insights and options for a healthy and productive future? Well, if we can, as you'll see, the road is not comfortable and not easily traveled. I don't think anyone can really understand what it feels like to walk through urban America in an African-American male's shoes. It's not an experience that can be easily conveyed to anyone. The majority of people in this society are afraid of black men. And to, to walk through a city and be constantly feared, not only by white people, but by black people as well, does something, I believe, to the spirit. You'll hear a lot of white women will talk amongst themselves, and every time they see a young black male on the street, they clutch their pocketbook, or they turn the other way, or they immediately think fear because of the negative stereotypes, particularly of young African-American men, that we see in the media. I think there's no question that, that, that we live in a racist society. We do. And uh, we need to recognize that. It won't help things if we pretend it doesn't exist. We do have uh, our problems in New York, and some have been highly publicized. Uh, I don't mean improperly so, but that they were just sort of sensational uh, and tragic. I'm a single parent of three kids. And I have a son who is 17, and I have a son who is 14, and I have a daughter who is 21. My older son was almost machine gunned down himself last summer. He was working at a Kroger store, and some youth came up to him that had mistaken him for someone else, and they wanted to kill him. A guy comes out of the car with a gun, and, you know. He tried, he tried, he threatens me and tells me that he's going to kill me and everything. And, you know, I just, you know, I kept my cool and everything. You know, I agreed with him and everything. And then he told me he would be back. And uh, once he told me he was going to be back, that's when I left. <laughs> What a pump. What a fool. <laughs> Mark. Uh, I wanted to be a visual artist, a painter. Sort of the next Ernie Barnes or uh, a black uh, Salvador Dali. You know? And uh, I, that was all nipped in the bud uh, when I got, uh, when I got um, uh, shot. A stranger, uh, brother with some serious problems, took a disliking to me, started uh, a fight. Not being one to damage people unnecessarily, I just simply overpowered him and threw him out. He came back a uh, half hour later with a gun and uh, attempted to take me out of the game. Uh, luckily, all he got was, you know, my eyes. Uh, not my vision. <laughs> my sister was an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary person. She had just f finished attending a party uh, in Los Angeles, and they were sitting in this, uh, in this woman's car, and uh, someone came up and on the driver's side, and my sister was on the passenger side, and demanded their purses. And as they were reaching for the purses, two shots uh, rang out. One supposedly went through the car, and uh, the second one struck my sister in her back uh, on her left side, and it uh, severed her artery. And uh, the guy apparently ran off and into a waiting car, and they sped off, and uh, he didn't even wait for the bags. We've got some serious, serious problems with uh, young people in the black community dying, but. I think a lot of that comes from the frustrations that they're dealing with and also from the uh, things that they're seeing on television that's telling them that death is not permanent, death is not final. Brothers, black men are hurting each other and challenging each other often with deadly results. This reality may be our most serious threat. It's not glamorous at all. I've been out there from it. Uh, it's not something no glamour to that. Um, the only glamour is if you survive it. Then 
bend it down at the knee. Being an African American in an emergency room is a tough situation because you tend to see outcomes of some of the worst qualities of people. I can do something to to take care of that gunshot wound or that stabbing or that medical problem. But the truth of the matter is, I feel bad because uh, what I can do is limited. When I, when I uh, came to in the hospital and realized that I couldn't see, I realized I probably wouldn't see again, I equipped myself with the determination that whatever life put in front of me I was going to get over it. I was going to climb over it or go around it or bust through it, but nothing was ever going to stop me from realizing my potential. All the things that happened to, to Sissy was just uh, for a black man to kill her for one of our own. But you know, I mean, the same thing happened to Malcolm and the same thing happened to a lot of our, our folks. It's not. I mean, in his mind, you know, he was about trying to get some money, you know, and it was about, so there's something else going on inside of him, and even hating, he hating himself. Violence seems to be everywhere today. For young African-American men, it can be anywhere, anytime. For Lynn Manning and E. David Ellington, it was at the hands of another brother. For Rodney King and Yosef Hawkins, it was at the hands of another race. In many ways, the image of violence and the black man is the most pervasive and damaging of negative perceptions. There is something you can't understand. The just man. There is something you can't understand. The just man. Percy the Corps has managed to survive, even though he spent most of his young life dealing in drugs and violence. You might beat up a couple of people, whatever, and people start respecting you, so um, it, it becomes an edge because you're scared for real, but you don't want to show it. Whenever you see a young black kid talking to another young black kid, it's like, hey, you don't tell me what to do. Nobody's used to the authority voice, that authoritarian figure telling somebody, sit down, be quiet, and don't move until I do this or whatever. Nobody, everybody's now like, hey, man, you can't tell me what to do. I'll boom, bam, I'll cap you. As a criminal lawyer, I see black men all of the time, and they opt for crime because they, they're trying to survive. Man, I ain't never shot nobody before. Yo, be careful with that, man. It's loaded. We don't have gun laws like we should have with 210 million privately owned handguns in America and about 45 million privately owned machine guns in America. Those who make the laws have neglected the people. You don't have to go to school for 10 years. You don't have to be able to write or sing or whatever to please somebody. You can just be yourself. Uh, have a gun, and a gun is the power for you. Homicide is the leading killer of young black males. But why is it so easy to get guns? Why, why don't we have a national movement that says we believe in gun control, but we can't get it through because of the NRA? So there are many powerful vested interests in this country, which really do uh, seem to be, you might use the word, um, uninterested in improving a lot of, of, of black people and black males. A lot of these black guys today don't even think that they're going to live beyond the age of 25. So if you're trying to talk with them, that's the whole thing is, well, if I make it to 25, I'm lucky anyway. So the first thing we have to do to them is, is, to, is, is to create an idea that, that there's something more to life than being young. There is something you can't understand. When I did hurt someone, it really didn't bother me at all. There is something you can't understand. The feeling is everybody thinks that they can just run over you. So what you have to do is you hurt somebody. I see people uh, hurting each other every day, whether it's physically or cutting them down verbally, just to prove themselves to be in with the boys, to be considered a man, as they want to be called. Derek Stevenson has witnessed it. Percy LaCour has survived it. Between images and realities, young black men are caught in the crossfire. It's a cold, mean, um, horrible thing. 
And it's, and, and it's, it's, no, it's no place for anybody to be. It's no place for anybody to learn how to be a man. We see the young men who exude, who reflect that negative image. Some of them are faceless and hopeless who come before us. And we try every way that we can to dispel that image. Unfortunately, in the 20 years I've sat on the bench, being a black man, you know, it, it, it just burns my heart to have to send young men to jail. And I focus my work on black homicide because it's 50% of the homicide. Now, when you look at why it's 50% of the homicides when we're 12% of the population, the major factor appears to be poverty. When you control for poverty and look at an equally poor white and equally poor black community, the homicide rates are the same. The violence is real, but a relentless and unbalanced portrayal of our black youth as violent can affect reality in a negative way. I don't understand why we aren't as outraged about the murders that are going on in Brownsville in New York, in Watts and Compton in Los Angeles, and the south side of Chicago, as we are about the terrorism that's taking place in places like Northern Ireland. I like getting high. Why you think I got a room here to charge my all? I'm a junkie. When I was a younger man, um, I had a bout with drugs and alcohol. and. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with uh, a lot of self-deprecation, had to do with um, me not feeling good, um, not about who I was, but what I was. Um, I got tired of fighting certain battles. Many African-American men are at risk, and at a time when drugs are so easily obtained, it's a dangerous combination. A young man in his teens with no vision about his future thinks he finds security and power in gangs and often accepts the camaraderie, even when deep inside he may know it's the wrong choice. Young people in America today, Hispanic, black, poor, if they have no place to recreate, they have no place to get a decent job, they have no place to get a decent meal, there's no other alternative for them but the mean streets of America. Some brothers I know that's in gangs, they want to get out of it, but they can't, they're too scared. Many of our young people have lost hope. Many of our young people do not feel they have a productive role in this society. What you find with the gang phenomenon, for example, is that you know many of these kids, you know, have have a family uh, uh, systems that have broken down, that uh, where where they've been abandoned, etc. So they, they 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 develop these mutual support societies. It's a lot of rough things going on here right now. And that's all they know. My mom say. Get with drugs, you get out of my house. You get with gangs, you get out of my house. You can be in a gang. Somebody can force you into that situation. Hectic these days. Really hectic. It's kind of hard for some kids to say no to gangs, like, but I say no. I don't call them the lost generation. I call them the left generation. Our responsibility is to go back and reclaim. I created the Shaka Foundation to bring some meaning to the loss of my own son who committed suicide October uh, 19th of 1990. Uh, I created it to help save some lives of children. I'm going to tell you, we with this ball here, I think I can still get you. I still got a half a step, a little bitty step, but I can. We got to learn to care. We got to learn to love. Uh, we can't just talk about it. We got to practice it. We got to live it. And we got to stop playing games. In St. Louis, a determined black man, Oval Miller, heads an independent organization called BASIC. It stands for Black Alcohol Drug Service Information Center. The areas of emotional pain associated with being black, racial self-hatred, cultural defense mechanisms, cultural seduction, all those things have to be taken into account when we're talking about uh, treating African Americans. And in Chicago, we spent an evening with a college-educated, decorated Vietnam veteran, a father trying to recover from a long life of drug dependency. I was introduced to marijuana in uh, July in Southeast Asia. And since then, that was in 1967. And since then, the, the, illness, this, my, the illness that I have has been progressive from one thing to another. We have three times as many liquor stores. We have five times as much advertising for liquor. One out of two homicides, alcohol, drug related. I had to hit rock bottom. You know, 
My mother and father told me that the stove was hot, so I didn't go near it. I sat, I got in the stove, see. And as a people, we do the same thing. As God is my witness, you must be out of your right mind. I'm not giving you a red cent. And what happened to your father's color TV? Mama, I smoked the TV. Lord have mercy on your dresses. Oh, I never stole anything from my family, you know, but it, may, it will make you do virtually anything, you know, to, to get money for it. Crack cocaine is a killer. You know, and it's been on the streets. And if we had crack cocaine 20 years ago, we'd be in we'd be in worse shape than we are right now. And I think what Martin Luther King says reflects in my mind, and that's the message we should give our young people today when it comes to this. You have to have something worth dying for, and drugs is not worth dying for. I often contemplated suicide. You know, I I, I felt like the world would be better off without me. I can't sit back and watch you destroy yourself. Well, they not in here. Where are the answers? Where is the balance to the images that have impacted in such a way to make two generations of African Americans doubt their own strength, their own spirit? Through my getting myself together, the, all the lives that I have touched negatively, maybe I can have some impact and, and save at least my own son's life. There is a consensus that integration has, in fact, been a deterrent to the very existence of the black community. The doors opened and many African Americans walked through to higher education, better life choices, and a sense of freedom to really develop their lives. We ended up defining or allowing freedom to be defined from its negative angle rather than the positive angle. Negative freedom is freedom from restraint or freedom from responsibility. Positive freedom is freedom to uh, be committed to one's fullest development. But there were people left behind. One third of black America is now middle class, but 50% of our children are growing up in poverty. What is the toll on their lives? I remember coming back home and talking to my friends was almost like visiting someone in prison because their scope on life was just so narrow. And the questions was almost like someone behind bars, like, yo, man, what's it like out there? You know? Well, you just like, what, you know, it's like so different from where they are, you know, that they see it as, like I said, from the same eyes as someone who's incarcerated. And we really do have a national problem. The great cities have it much worse than other places. Surprise, surprise. The great cities have the poor people. The great cities have... Uh, for about a dozen years now, been neglected in a way that almost never gets mentioned. And so you find cities and states being assigned new responsibilities without the resources. Those cities and states are turning to the private sector. They're turning to private foundations, they're turning to corporations, they're turning to private citizens, as if private resources could somehow serve as a substitute for government. They can't. Nobody chooses to be poor, nobody chooses to be homeless. But life can beat you down like that, and you can't turn your back on these people. More non-black Americans live on the street than African Americans, but you don't notice them as much. Maybe that's because young black men are trying desperately to get off the street. I think that the president should look forward more to take care of right here. It makes no sense to be homeless. You see where I live. When it rained, I had to pull it over. To be identified as homeless, to, um, to not really have any place that you and your family can call your own, really has a devastating and I think long-term residual impact. Community supportive living systems in Chicago is one of the few housing programs for homeless men between the ages of 18 and 25. But our concept is to provide a full range of services uh, for our program participants where they can have the time to go to school and, and achieve certain goals in education, uh, find substantial employment, and do the things and learn the things necessary where they could become self-sufficient uh, within the community. My name is Jeremy Woodard. Uh, I needed some way of becoming independent and learning life skills 
and finding a place to stay, a real place to stay, a home where I had other people that I could live with, other people that could, I could talk with and do things with and just feel like I'm at another home setting, which I didn't have before. My name is Mark Arthur. The um, program itself has been very beneficial to me because I've always been the type that's very distant, uh, a loner. And uh, being here with the guys, interacting with them, uh, it's helping me to come out of my shell and help me understand, you know, what you can do with and for others is eventually doing for yourself. People continue to, to feel that most black men are involved in each gang activities, selling drugs, etc. And that may be true for for a, a portion of them. But we also, also see the youth that has just have had family problems and end up homeless. What we find many of them, all they need is the nurturing for them to understand that somebody is concerned about them and care about them. The images and the realities of the disease of AIDS are overwhelming. In recent years, it has proven to have no favorite victims. I always felt that the, the loss that I have with my son is that could I have done more? Could I have said more to him? Could I have put my foot down stronger? Could I have made it more, uh, could I have made it, uh, could have been more adamant in my attitude about his, uh, what I felt, uh, profligacy with his own life? Uh, and I'm not sure that he would not have welcomed more guidance from me. Only now are we beginning to recognize that adolescents are, uh, could be the very next wave of this epidemic. And what we're finding now is that the number of heterosexual um, numbers of people becoming infected are rising, and in particular, um, teenage girls. Obviously, we can't, you can't be as free as maybe at one time you could be. And it does put a lot of emphasis on monogamous relationships and being honest. And you really have to take the responsibility upon yourself of making yourself aware of all of the possibilities, of all of the ramifications, because there are diseases out there that will kill you. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all of the things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about sex. Let's because of the, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. It was absolutely monumental that Magic Johnson came forward with his disclosure of, of, of being HIV infected. From young people um, who were playing basketball in the streets of, in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant to corporate America down on Wall Street. All of these individuals are now saying to themselves well, uh, that, damn, you know, I can get this too. So Magic Johnson's disclosure of his HIV uh, status was absolutely vital. It took us. It takes us into this next decade. This next decade meaning that homo heterosexual people are just as susceptible to this. This is a virus that does not care who you make love to. What's the church's official position on sex? Say it again. Absolutely. Does that mean no sex? Yes. All right. Now, for those who do not take the church's position on abstinence, we ask them at least to use what? Say it again. Protection. Violence, poverty, abuse, homelessness, and AIDS. Many of our young black men and women continue to face each of these terrible living conditions in the 90s. But as you see, and as our history has proven, African Americans are strong and resilient. We survive. I've been changed since I'm whispering. The Lord has lifted me. I want to be God's to be ready when my Jesus comes. And there was this one guy who would get up and sing in the church, and he'd be all, no, like, when my Jesus comes. And I'd always sing that. I'd sing that, too. So that's what I kind of sing to myself when it gets a little, a little rough. I do always sing that. I testified, my mama cried Black people died when the other man lied See the TV, listen to me, double trouble I'm a hole and I'm coming
Music videos are dynamic force, creating images that are as misleading as they are exciting. In Brooklyn, Chuck D, a public enemy, and Daddy O of Stitch Sasonic spoke candidly about the images of rap and the responsibility of rap artists. Rappers only rap about what they see. They only rap about really what they know about. I think that people need to understand, though, that rap is a, a, a part of the big family of rock and roll and the same uh, medium that allowed Elvis to twist his hips, Little Richard to throw boots in the audience, and Jackie Wilson to get on the floor and grind. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, what I use in a battle. Never has it been such a time when so many black men actually got a platform to say, this is how I feel. This is what I'm saying. This is what I see. It's effed up, and you're going to hear me now. There ain't no way to duck me. Well, 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 it's the L, L, the C, I, the F, A, H, C, Y, the Q, double E, and is the reason I must be myself. Queen Latifah is, is a role model that I would want for any of my daughters. Now who got the mind? I do. Why you little played out shoes? I'm allergic to wax. She's beautiful. She's proud. She's into her, her, her skin. She knows who she is. She wants to grow. And she's, uh, she's got courage. And she's, uh, she stands straight up and she, 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 she's about something. She looks into the future with a lot of hope. Contemporary music videos featuring young women, particularly young black women, are given to expressions like bitch and whore and fly girl, and so much of it through the sheer visual impact of the music. You get all this negative videos, all this negative music about our women, done by us, done by us, talking about our women, you know, look at the names of some of the groups, man, you got, you know, you got bees with the attitude, you got, I mean, I was like, look at what girls are calling themselves now, and you see for the first time a very negative self-image that black women, young black women have of themselves, and as they grow older, it's going to be a negative self-image that a, a grown black woman has now. Boys and girls grow up with this bitches and hoes mentality. And I think, and I may get a lot of flack for this, but I think it is a very unfair burden and an unfair responsibility. But in order to change the mentality, it's got to come from these girls. It has to. If I need it in the morning or the middle of the night, it's the love and it's strong thing he got it going on and as long as you have women who will continue to degrade themselves, then you will have men who are going to love it. Now we have to go back to the parents. The parents have to educate the little girls and the little boys the same way. You cannot teach them different values. You have to teach them the same exact thing. The images of women. We had black females with very large behinds. And that image, right now, whether you want it to be or not, is in your head. And it's in there sick. In I fact, would challenge a group. Here, I would use a video them. and challenge them. Well, what is these messages saying? I think young people need to hear that. They need to hear an adult person say, um, yes, I mean, we're all looking at this video together, but. I'm challenging you on what this stuff means. And all of it starts going, the music starts The program is called Healthy Teens and Young Adults. And the focus of the program is on males and females ages 10 to 24 in a specific area here in Baltimore City. And the aim of the program is to reduce teenage pregnancy and curb the extremely high tide of sexually transmitted diseases. I've heard a lot of brothers confess that, well, this is only a video, it's only a song, it's only a word, why do you get so upset? That's because when it, art, life starts imitating art and these attitudes are taken as literal and as what should be propagated. And it's kind of, I mean, these are supposed to be the cream of the crop, the best of the best black men. And when they still use these words and these ways of describing women, that are so derogatory, it kind of hurts at times. When someone is using the, the derogatory epithets towards black women, 
you will also find the same people in almost every instance using the same negative epithets to their brothers, to the, to the other black men around them as terms of endearment. And I think that says something deeper about how black people, about how we are taught to feel about ourselves. As black women as a whole, we have to say, okay, if you're going to use these words or, or treat, act in this way, we're not going to be around you. The American sports figure, the sports hero, has become the most vulnerable of images. Maybe sold too hard as a role model, the African-American sports hero often suffers a troubling reality. When I saw Mike Tyson fall, it really seemed like a reflection on a black man, but then, that's again, that's just him as an individual. When, the, when people are watching the news and they see things like that, they'll say, well, that's another black man going down, the, you know, going down the hole. What's happening these days with Gooden, with Tyson, is that uh, they've forgotten the key lesson that a lot of us learn, is that the rug can be pulled out from under you at any minute. But usually what happens to brothers in particular is that they are, they are of so much value to the system that the system sort of gives them a longer and longer leash. And the implications, you can do anything you want, but always what happens is at the key moment, they pull the rug from them. And in each case, whether it's Tyson uh, or whether it's Gooden, uh, they've gotten to a point where they think that nothing will ever happen to them. They can do anything they want. Hey, Jordan. And, hey, Jordan. Who'd you expect? They're my friend? There are less than 3,000 African Americans in this country who can sing and dance, play football, baseball, or basketball, earning $100,000 a year. Well, there are more black people, uh, black couples, in Cleveland alone earning that amount of money. But yet and still, that's the stereotypical positive image of African Americans in this country. And that distorts the imagery for our young people. Well, the chances of our average young black child becoming a Michael Jordan, a two, slim and none. But God made thousands of black attorneys and scientists and teachers and plumbers and all of those are worthy professions, worthy and honorable uh, modes of living, uh, constructive uh, modes of living. And, but we don't talk about that. The media doesn't talk about that. I mean, everybody's not going to be an entertainer. And everybody's not supposed to be an entertainer. And we all don't have to be millionaires. Money is not the key. Money makes life easier. But money is not what gives you success. Integrity, dignity, self-respect. That is success. Since the birth of a nation, films have been among the most persuasive sources of negative images of black Americans. There have been very few exceptions. The independent vision of pioneer filmmaker Oscar Michel. The power and pride of Paul Robeson and the brilliance of the young Sidney Poitier. But today, with the advent of so many talented new black filmmakers, the challenges are clear. Can we, once and for all, bring the realities of our experience to film? <laughs> well, everybody's here, so go ahead and have a good time. Okay. Oh, and Trey, baby, do me a favor. Talk to Darren for me. Talk to him seriously. I am so sick and tired of him going in and out of there. Maybe some of what you got to rub off on. Okay. It has a great effect on people. Powerful effect on people. Um, uh, there's so many things that can happen. Um, there's so many things that people can take from a performance or maybe a piece that they see and incorporate in their real life. doesn't matter if the reality of, of, of the characters in the piece is different than what they saw. It's what they saw that, that affects them. When, when I talk to young people about what, what they're hungry for right. on the big screen, okay. what they want on the surface is what they're getting, the violence the sex, the gangs. Um, in a lot of ways, that's what a lot of us, un unfortunately, can relate to. And that's what's going to sell. Hey, Peppy. Touch the dog. Don't. Touch the dog. I don't think that the crime in the streets, um, the kinds of atrocities that occur, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, 
are um, based upon uh, movies. I don't think violence, uh, that's what is based on movies. Perception becomes reality for some of us. We see things, uh, we see negative things, and what we see and what's put out there for us becomes our reality. And that's what we plug into. And that's what we dwell on. This on deck. In every class, there's always one joker who thinks that he's smarter than me. That was no good. Daddy, the car's fine. You're gonna mess it up. No, I just want my baby to look good. Then unplug it. Hey, Nick. We Jackie. make our statements about who we are through what we do and how we live our lives, you know. So I was able to, to, to make choices in my work, and subsequently I've been able to do that too, to make choices in my work which reflect my interpretation of the world, whose side I'm on, I'm on in the world, and what's important to me in the world. next generation of people getting into entertainment should look at both sides of the camera, but definitely look, take a good long look behind the camera because that's where a lot of the power is. The control happens when you go to a studio with a project and they say, oh, this is not going to, no, we're going to have to juice this up. We're going to have to move this up, make this exciting, give a little action, give a little killing, a little conflict because the story of love and caring is just not going to sell nowadays in today's market. We have to be able to do that. It is essentially, at least in my opinion, going to be the ultimate responsibility of African Americans to begin to reshape and represent uh, and reposition the images of black people. In supporting this program, AT&T continues an association with our community that began over 100 years ago. When Granville T. Woods, an African American, invented a telephone transmitter, patented it, and sold it to Alexander Graham Bell. There are black men and women who are doing extraordinary work in the community. It's, we don't, they don't get the publicity that the wolf packs and the gangs get. And that's the unfortunate thing, but they do the work. Black Americans are not unfamiliar with the hard road. We have endured slavery, Southern terrorism, segregation, prejudice, poverty, and decades of racial propaganda. But we have risen to the challenges, and as we have triumphed, America has benefited. The anti-slavery movement fueled the suffrage movement. Reconstruction programs generated models for public education. The civil rights movement expanded the liberties of all Americans and set a model for democratic struggle from Beijing to Pretoria. When you got dreams, you got hope, you got everything. We always had dreams. We were never a hopeless race of people. We always said, man, one day, we used to, man, back in the 50s, 60s, we thought one day was going to come when racism was going to end. I think now we're realizing it ain't going to never end. I think that's what's happening. I would like to, to see our political uh, uh, and uh, education and, and, and religious leadership do is get engaged in some strategic planning. Now, what does strategic planning start with? It starts with what assets do you control that you fully control? We have to all become skilled people to understand that we got to go to the table and make our deals and make our precedent known. This is what we got to do. Better keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. We're one nation. We really are one world. And the more we recognize and realize that, then we'll come up with common sense answers to spend our needed time and the needed resources to address the real evils of mankind. If we get to kids early enough, if we embrace them now with programs that we know that work, share among existing organizations in the city those programs mm -hmm. which have been proved and get to work, we can do something about our black boys and men. You know, Dr. King said, uh, what's important is that you realize your potential. And so if, uh, you can be a physician or an attorney or whatever. Uh, and if you don't want to be any of those things, if you decide you want to be a street sweeper, that's all right, too. You just be the best blasted street sweeper anybody ever saw. And I always tell young people, I say, you know you can be mayor. And they understand that. 
the belief which the teacher, the principal, and the system holds on behalf of the child, either good or bad, has a major impact on whether that child is going to do well. Uh, if I believe that you are intelligent, that you can do well, that you can grow up and be a contributor in this society, all the things that I do are going to contribute to you believing that I believe in you. Give them a purpose so they understand why they're doing the work they're doing. You can't just say do it. You have to back it up with a reason where before when we were youngsters, the teacher just said do it and you just did it automatically. But they want to know why. And you have to keep coming up with good reasons why because it has to have a meaning to them in order for them to do anything that you're asking. But it was that kind of thinking that always made me want to know, want to learn and see what else is out there. If you can't build a family, you can't make a nation. That every nation is based upon its, its, its family. And uh, I made an individual commitment of my own that uh, if uh, we didn't make a nation no other kind of way, at least we'd make good families. You have to love. You have to love those children, regardless of how they do and what they do. And then you have to show them that love. If you um, don't respect, don't respect your, not just your elders, but your friends, they won't respect you. I come up to this classroom because I work. I want to be a doctor when I grow up. You got to think about what you want to do in your future so you can help your fellow African Americans. The heart. The heart. The heart wants me to do more for the community. If I grow up, I want to be a surgeon. Stay in school. Keep trying. If you reach within yourself and believe in yourself and believe that you can be the best, you can be the best. It's your own decision. But in your best interest, do something that will save your own life, not lose it. Today, we face great challenges, grave reality. From the kinds of faces and stories we have shown you, our images of tomorrow will evolve. Reality starts there, too, in our families, our churches, our communities. In black men and women of courage and commitment, we hope the rest of the nation will come to understand that our concerns are interdependent. We must restore our commitment as a nation to our children. We, the people, hold the power and all the possibilities. Thank you. I'm Louis Gossett, Jr. Picture a man with a gun in his hand. Crack in his pocket and no one to stop it. Now focus on the guy walking by with the book in his hand. He's got another plan. Both the guys live on the same block. One learning from teacher, the other from cop. The image began. The reality stops. Which one is real and which one is not? Picture a man with a gun in his hand. Crack in his pocket and no one to stop it. Now focus on the guy walking by with the book in his hand. He's got another plan. Both the guys live on the same block. One learning teacher, the other from college, the image began, the reality stops, which one is real and which one is not. Images and reality, images and reality, images and reality, images and reality.